let's give James a round of applause now, so he can. Everybody, thank you so much for your patience. I'm uh, just adjusting the display settings a bit here. And thank you, VJ, for the incredibly high production quality of this meetup. I know it's a bit delayed, but everything's recorded and streamed, and it's all going on YouTube after, and that's for everyone's benefit. So thank you, VJ, for all of his hard work. Okay. So let's get started. Before I go on and talk to you guys a little bit about Docker containers, I want to ask, who here has worked with containers before? Who here is familiar with Docker? OK. A couple hands. Cool. All right. Yes. Yeah, so some of you are warm to it, but some people have no idea. And that's fine. That's, that's totally fine. Um, who has never even heard of Docker before they saw this meetup? Like, has anybody just never even, whoa, what is that? OK. OK, good. So. My name is James Earl. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work on our customer-facing engineering team. Take that for what you will. It's a lot of fun. We get to travel and uh, work with partners a lot of the time, building really cool solutions to their problems. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how you can Dockerize TM, your Node.js app. So first of all, what are containers? Containers, you might think, really hot buzzword. It's kind of everywhere. Containers, Docker, <coughs> Kubernetes, like all of these different things, orchestrators and stuff. What does it mean? Um, you might not be familiar, but a great analogy is shipping containers. Think about logistically when you see those huge, huge boats and they've got all these different shipping containers on them that are like 20 feet long, 8 feet high, 8 feet wide, that sort of thing. Do you know what's in those containers? Of course not. And neither do the people who are shipping the containers. When you've got that big boat with hundreds of those containers, they have no idea what's on them. Maybe they do. Maybe they have a, a clue. But it doesn't matter if they do or they don't, because all they need to know is that that container is 20 feet long, 8 feet high, and 8 feet wide. Okay, That's the only thing that matters. So the reason this is a great analogy is because a Docker container is a virtualized environment a virtualized environment on your machine that acts just like the physical containers, but for your code instead. So anywhere that supports a Docker container can support anything you're writing, any app you're writing. doesn't matter what framework, Python, JavaScript, Node.js, Go, anything. So all that matters is that they can support Docker. They could say, hey, here's a space that is exactly 20 feet you know, long and at eight feet wide, eight feet tall, put your container in there. Whatever's inside will work. And that's the idea behind how containers happen. So you might think if a container is just like a mini kind of computer inside your computer, is it like a virtual machine? And no, it's not. So there are specific differences between containers and virtual machines. So a virtual machine is its own complete sandbox. It does use your computer's resources if it's local. It could also be on the cloud somewhere like Azure. But not necessarily the same thing as a container. And that's because there's a lot more overhead. The kernel and everything inside a virtual machine is completely sandboxed, and it's its own environment. But a container, now a container has way less overhead. It's really lightweight. It's really fast. And the way it does that is because a container will lean on your operating system's kernel a bit for all of its system calls. So the container is really lightweight and fast, and it's kind of an agile virtual machine. And that, uh, that kind of setup allows you to use containers for a lot of different fun things. So we're going to get to that in just a second. So the idea behind containers overall is that you have no nonsense deployment. You can just put your app in this thing, and here you go. Everywhere that supports a container just works. That's the idea. So why do you want to use containers? Kind of like what I said, no nonsense deployment. But what else? Let's talk about some specific benefits. Performance is one. So containers, like I said, they're lightweight. They're faster. They can make these kind of system calls. and and um, access your computer's memory 
leaning on your host operating system a lot more. And that allows it to operate a lot faster than a virtual machine might be able to because of way less overhead. Another benefit, microservices. Who's heard of the word microservices? Big buzzword, another one, right? So why do you want to use microservices? Let's take a look at the left here. We've got a monolithic architecture for an application. A lot of people are probably really familiar with this. So, well, I've got my database. That's, that holds everything. And then I have a, a layer of code that accesses the database and then spits it out to the top right there. Some business logic. And then that shows it to your user. So that is a vertical application. Big monolith, kind of ugly, but very traditional. That's what most people know. Microservices are a lot, uh, I guess, very different. Sorry. And the reason why microservices are so different is because every microservice is a piece of your application. So you write your application with microservices in mind so that instead of having all of these, all of these tables in your like, one big database, it could, be it could be Cosmos DB, it doesn't have to be like a table, it could be a file storage or anything. You have a single microservice for one specific thing. Microservices means you have a bunch of different apps that do one very specific thing. And the point of this is so that you can decouple all of these applications. So let's say this handles, this app here only logs and handles the contact points and the emailing between your users on your website and your, um, I don't know, your sales team, right? So let's say that microservice is the one that's in charge of serving up that data, that web page, and handling the response. And that's all. So if that microservice goes down, the others are fine. They can still like shop around on your website. They can like look at a gallery. They can do all sorts of things. Now let's go back here. We're on the monolithic architecture. What happens when something breaks? It all, it all breaks. Everything is completely knit together. So by, by using microservices architecture and containers, we can have a little more durability and a little less rigidness. It's not like a big stick that it's just broken. It's like a bunch of branches. The stick is still OK. Another reason you might like using containers is security. Containers are isolated. They lean on their host operating system, like I said but in their virtualized environment, especially when you're using microservices, you have an added layer of security. Another reason is consistency. So let's say you're a team of 10 developers. You want to make sure you all have the same environment going on and the same application version, the same setup for absolutely everything, all of your environment variables, everything you've got installed, all the versioning will be the exact same if you're running Docker containers. So everything that you're working on locally could be different, but when you push it up to a Docker container, the consistency across your deployments, across all of your testing suites, across all of your production environments is going to be exactly the same. Last, of course, is scalability. So like I've mentioned a few times now, these microservices, these containers, they're extremely light and they're agile. And the point of that is so that you can spin up and spin down as many of these as you need in a high traffic environment. So let's say you're the people who uh, make the website for the Olympics, which is actually hosted on Azure, FYI. Isn't that cool? But the Olympics comes around once every couple of years, summer and winter. So let's, let's, take a th let's think about that for a minute. They have their website, but every couple of years, their traffic is increased by probably 10,000. Like, no, who, who, just, who went to the Olympics website today? <laughs> Not me, OK? So think about it. When you need to scale that quick, and it's this fast and easy and agile to scale with width, then containers and microservices architecture is exactly what you're looking for. If you've got this big monolithic app and you need to spin up duplicates of that app over and over and over, then that's going to be way more overhead. It's going to be way harder on your system admins. And it's just going to be a nightmare, especially. So uh, scalability, very important. So let's talk about how it works. 
first step is source code, of course. That's where everything starts. You've got your source code, and you do something using a Docker file. The Docker file is how you specify the steps, what are, what are called layers, to build your image. So you're creating an image. Think about a virtual machine image. It has an operating system and different things going on. Um, you define an, an amount of processing power and RAM that you're going to give this image. But all you've done now is create a local image. Okay, so you've got your source code, and now you've wrapped it in a box, but you haven't quite put the wrapping paper around it. You haven't tied the bow. So what's next? We need to upload this to a cloud registry. So by putting it on a cloud registry, you can use something like Azure Container Registry, or you can use a public, the Azure Container Registry is public, but you can also use Docker Hub. That's their registry. So you can get different versions of Node, for example, and different versions of Go, anything like that. It's all available on Docker Hub. But again, Azure Container Registry is where you're going to put your own containers, usually. Um, now we've kind of, we're getting a little bit closer to the final result, but it's in the cloud, and that image is what we need to use to deploy a container in the cloud. So if you want to host a website, you need to have your image in the cloud, but you, you don't have a container yet. What you have is a painted picture of your container. Now it's like you're kind of printing it. Bam, now we have a container. So these are little, uh, right here I've kind of annotated Docker push, Docker build, AZ container create. These are some of the commands that we use, but not all of them. There's a lot of in between that I'm skipping here. I wish it was as easy as these three commands, okay? There is a little bit more. So let's kind of reiterate. We've got our code. We wrap it in the box, Docker build, by defining our build file, which I'll show you an example in just a minute. Then we upload it to a cloud registry. Once it's in the cloud, we can access it from anywhere, right? It's the internet. And now, az container create, that is the command line tool, the Azure CLI, cross-platform CLI, that we can use to, do, to um, create a new instance of an Azure container. So let's look at how to get started. I mentioned this Docker file a lot, right? Here's what an example Docker file looks like, probably the simplest one you could have. Let's walk through the steps. Each one of these is a keyword that adds a layer onto your image, telling it to do one more thing. And these are the steps that your container needs to take to make your application accessible. So the first thing we do is we get an installation of Node on our container. We bring that in. That if you're connected um, to Docker Hub, that, that'll just pull right in. Now. We need to define a working environment. So the next two commands, right here, make directory, and well, the next three commands, actually. So we make a working directory where we're going to copy our code into for the container. So here, we're copying local code and then kind of shoving in the container, saying, here you go. Next, we are assigning it as our working directory. We're going to run npm install, so all of those dependencies that you've got in your package.json file are going to get installed inside your container. And then we're just going to say npm start. We're just going to have it run, right? And if you do like express in it, like initialize a basic express app, the one that just says, welcome to express, and you know, the, white, the black text, white screen, simplest thing you could do, you get this set up no time at all. When it runs npm start, it'll just show you, um, well, it depends, actually. So you can get this set up and run it locally, or you can deploy it on the cloud. So like I said, there's that step where you have Docker on your machine. It's a local image. And you could run that already. Like, you could run that image and take a look at it. And it's, it's a container on your machine. You could, you could add it to a container. But the container is just local. No, nobody else could access it. It's kind of like running WAMP server or something like that. So all this is doing is adding the layers and building our image. So this is what that looks like when you run it. So up top, you can see Docker build. Now I'm telling it to build the current directory. Apologies, sorry. I'm telling it to build one directory level 
below. So I'm up here looking at this one um, application I have called Dockerize Node. Inside that folder is a Docker file. So I'm saying build that image and dash t is tag and tag it as Docker Node or Docker Code, sorry. So now this is what this is going to go through all of these steps and create my image. So if I were to do something like Docker images, that will list all of my images. This one will be shown with a specific hash. The next step, again, what I was saying before is that there are a lot of steps in between. Like we need to um, have our own registry. I've already created one here by this time, right? So you can see we're tagging the Docker code image. When we're tagging an image, where um, it's kind of like renaming it and duplicating it. So the point of doing that is that we have the original image, Docker code, but then we can tag it with the URL to my cloud registry. So when I say ta Docker tag, Docker code, Docker sample ACR, Azure, Azure ACR, blah, 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 what that's saying is take this image and just create a copy of it called this and we're adding the URL to my cloud registry where it will sit in the cloud and it's accessible. And by adding that URL, Docker knows that when I say Docker push in the next line, because that URL is there, it knows that that is the, the uh, location of where I want the container to exist or the image to exist. Sorry. So if I had a different address there, like if it was a dockerhub.com URL, then it would push to Docker Hub, right? You just need to have an account and credentials and things. So, uh, sorry, that one's duplicated. Again, skipping a lot of steps in between for the sake of brevity, but once we have that image um, floating in the cloud. It's on my cloud registry. That's a service Azure provides, but also you can use other public cloud registries. You can say AZ ACR show. So what I'm asking there is for details about something specific inside my cloud registry. So ACR is Azure Cloud Registry. Show Docker sample ACR. That is a specific registry. And what I'm looking for is the login server name. So that is the URL to my server for my cloud registry. And I'm asking because that is the username you need to provide um, when you're creating the container right here. So we ask for the password, which I've blocked out. It's just a big hash. Nobody's going to copy it down, but I blocked it out anyways. And it's the same thing. We're getting these credentials from our container registry. And these container registry credentials are used in creating a container. So it just needs the correct information um, in the az container create command. So this is a pretty verbose command, but let's kind of break it down. We have az container create. So we're creating a new Azure container. Next, we're saying dash g. Well, that's a resource group. On Azure, you can have a resource group, um, a group of different cloud resources. It's kind of like the, a regular directory structure. All of your files are your resources, and a resource group is a directory holding them, right? So that's all a resource group is. It just needs to know where to place the container. Same thing with dash n. That's just a name. Dash dash image is where things get a little more interesting. So that's the image that we uploaded already, right? That's, exist that's there. It's in our cloud registry. So we give it the Docker sample, Docker sample ACR, blah, blah, blah. This, this command goes like way out to here, but I had to, I had to cut it off in the screenshot. I'm so sorry. But then we ask for the password. You can see <laughs> the very last letter of the word password right there, D, and then there's a block. And that was the password. So the, like I said, the URL acts as the username. And then we have a password, which is just a long hash. And we say, yeah, so some other things, DNS name label. And that's just a, a unique thing to provide your container. It needs a DNS so that it can have an endpoint. And then you ask for specific ports. This part, very important. So 
when you're writing your Node app, there's always that part right at the right in the last bit of your app.js or your main.js, index.js, whatever you want to call it, where you ask to expose a certain port. It's usually like 443 or 3000 or like 8080, something like that. And here, you need to make sure you're asking for the same port. Okay? And you also need, in your Docker file, that's one thing um, I neglected to mention prior, in your Docker file, there's, an, there's a command called expose, and you'll need to expose that port in your image. So in your app, you're saying um, http.serve, right? app.serve port 3000 or whatever. So then in your Docker file, you need to say expose 3000, and then when you're creating a container, it comes back again, you need to say use ports 3000, or expose those ports, right? So that's a high-level look at containers, right? I skipped a couple of the in-between steps, like how you create a registry and how you get those credentials and how you log into the Azure CLI and things like that. But a great place where I've detailed it a lot more is my blog. I have two specific posts dedicated to this topic that go into way more detail. They have every single step and a much more thorough explanation. You can also look at Microsoft's official documentation on this topic, which is also extremely thorough, and there's great, great examples. Could you run the image in the container? Yes. Uh, I forgot, but does uh, the container create command also create a network? A virtual network? Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't I don't think so, but I, I'm going to say no. Expose, like, port 8080 as well? I mean, you yeah, you can expose more than one port. Okay. Okay. Sorry for bugging, but um, when we pull an, like, an image from the registry to the local machine, does it take space on the local machine, or is that just like... Uh, it does take a little bit of space. Like, your container is still, it's on your machine, right? It's not just kind of magic that doesn't exist, but does exist. Like, it does occupy some of your computer's resources. And that's why it's great using it on the cloud, because you never have to use your own machine. Yeah. If, I, if I was to look at a Docker image file, is it just a big binary thing, or is there anything human readable about it? That was the doc oh, the Docker image file. Yeah. Um, okay, so I meant the Docker file. The Docker image, um, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to say it's probably just a big binary you wouldn't really get much information from looking at it. Yes? Can I install a Docker C, C, the, the community, uh -huh. the Docker community, the version on my machine, and get my web uh, up and running on my machine instead of going out to? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, totally. Like, you can. My computer's been having issues, so I wasn't sure if I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. So. Here we go. OK, I don't need to log in right now, but it started. So we're good. I'll zoom back in. OK. I'll leave this over here this time. Yeah. OK. So one more time. Let's try Docker build Dockerize node. We're going to tag that as dockerize node. There we go. Right. Pulling from library node. Hey, it works. And that's the demo. <laughs> no, now now we're now we're in action. Let's see what happens. When you say pulling from library node, that's a local library on your machine? So this is pulling the dependencies that we've specified in our Docker file from places like Docker Hub. So when I say Docker pull node, it'll go grab whatever, it'll grab, by default, it'll take the latest version of node from Docker Hub. That's what it does. But if I say Docker pull colon v8.0.3 or whatever, then it'll pull that version. Whatever's available. And then you can also get different, um, you know, while this is doing that, I may as well show you um, Docker Hub. 
because I think that is relevant. Um, DockerHub.com, I think is what it's called. No? Never mind. Okay, so hub.docker.com. So let's say you want to use Node. There's all these different versions. That's definitely not true. Docker store? My, I'm not sure what it's looking for right there. Node? OK, there we go. Node by Docker. So here we go. Over 10 million downloads of this. These are the different Docker links. We've got Alpine. I don't know exactly the difference between all these different versions of Node, but Slim, on build, Alpine, etc. You can use any one of these versions, whatever you need. And that's just Docker pull, whatever. Or in your Docker file, which is um, going to be, let's see, code. Rise node and code. In this file, there we go. That's just from node latest. And this will pull node the latest build onto your image. So before, I guess I forgot this part. You have to expose the port you're using. Okay. So now let's uh, let's go back. We've made a little bit of progress. This is great. Don't worry about those. We're just going to ignore those. <laughs> <laughs> now, Docker images. Here we go. Dockerized node. We can see right here. It's, uh, it's been created. We've got this repository tagged as latest. This is the hash for the image. And that's how large it is. Almost 700 megabytes. That's so. That's your image that you created. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just created that. Uh, yeah. Just throwing it out there. Uh, there's different versions of like Node or let's say MySQL, whatever you want to download. They're like minified, uh, less memory consuming versions of that software. I think that's what Alpine is for as an example. So Alpine is like a super small version of Node if you want a really tiny little like I don't really know what they cut out to make it so small, to be honest. I don't know the intricacies of that. But um, I'm using the default node latest, and that's going to be a lot larger. And that's probably why it's a few hundred megabytes in size. So let's, uh, let's just try this. Docker run detach port 3000, 3000. Dockerize node. Great. OK, so. Um, Can you blow it up a little bit for us? <coughs> yes, thank you for asking. So here's what I just created. Oh. Container ID name. So this is my image. But I've, I've created a container now, Docker container list, after running this container locally. This is just for me. So if it worked, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. I should be able to go to my browser and go to localhost 3000. There it is. That's the application, right? So now the next step involves uh, a little bit more. And I don't have any of the Azure stuff set up. And it's a bit more arduous. But like I said, I'm, I'm going to end here because we, we got it. We got it up, up there. But <laughs> it's all available on my blog, which I'll show the link again, and on Microsoft's documentation. So right here. Don't look anywhere else. Only. <laughs> all right. So please follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter. If you'd like to ever talk to me about anything, check out my blog. Check out the documentation. Thank you so much. All right, question. So you had you ran on the local host. 
but is it always running? Because I, it seemed like you were... You create the container, right. and then it's, yeah, it's running. Like the container is just sitting there occupy, occupying a little bit of space and extremely minimal CPU cycles. Okay. But you can visit it, like I did, okay. and then it'll say, oh, it'll spike a little bit and say, well, I got a web request, now I need to handle it. Your app code will run and do whatever it does, and it'll serve you that web page. Okay. And then you could kill it. All yeah, I could, I could go do the exact same thing. I could kill it, and then the next time I try to hit localhost, yeah. um, it'll just okay. not work. Okay. So how, how long did you feel that you started understanding? Was there a learning curve like this, or was it like that? Oh, I mean, I started learning containers like a couple months ago. Okay. Don't, don't worry about it. It's extremely approachable. Yes. Yeah. And honestly, I, I just used our documentation. I used the stuff Microsoft puts out. Mm -hmm. I just walked through the examples. There's tons. Yes. Just check it out if you're eager to learn. Can you put containers in containers? <laughs> it's containers all the way down. <laughs> anyway. um, like so yes. Um, in, I mean, I think you can. I've never done it. I don't know why you would want to. Well, like if you have like a, um, like a web application, so you set up like a whole um, whole server, and then you have like the database part. It's, it's two different containers, like one version one, one just the Chrome one. See, then you're you're kind of going against the notion of why containers are good if you're doing that. So remember when I showed you the monolith versus the microservices? Yeah, all you're doing then is creating microservices and then putting them in a monolith. And that's not going to do anything. You're sandwiching them together. What you want is a tree branch kind of, yeah. right? So you want them to be separate, completely separate containers um, that just kind of communicate to each other. Okay. Um, this is something I think that I got from watching the tutorial or something. Okay. Uh, aren't containers simply like a process, like a you know, for process like on a CPU on a local machine? They're not really virtual networks. It's a, it's a, you could consider, like, virtual machines are hyper-virtualized. These are kind of less virtualized, you know, because they are a virtual environment, but all of their system calls, they share a kernel with your host operating system. So a virtual machine's kernel is its own thing. It's completely boxed in, but there is that tie to your host operating system, whatever that may be, in the cloud or your local machine from a container. They're leaning on your host operating system for their system calls and stuff, and that's where some of the benefits in containers come from. Um, is yeah. there testing or validation that you can do to make sure that something that you know, runs great locally will really work when it's like up in the cloud in multiple iterations? That's the point of containers. If it works locally, you, that environment is in a capsule. So once it's put in that capsule and you just shift it to the cloud, it's still in the exact same environment. All of your app code is inside the walls of that container. And as long as the container itself gets set up properly on Azure or any other cloud service, then your app's going to be running in the exact same environment. On your machine, in the cloud, on someone else's computer, it's all the same. Yeah. So in your um, microservices uh, architecture diagram, mm -hmm. in that case, would you have a, a separate container that performs other container orchestration? If, like you said, each microservice is a container in and of itself. So you're touching on something a little bit more interesting. So Kubernetes is another really popular thing, and that's a container orchestrator, right? So if you want a Kubernetes cluster, that is a variety of containers that are running your app, and that is really popular right now for scaling out applications um, really quickly. So let me figure this out. Um, Uh, um, yeah, let me just bring this back. So right here, there we are. Okay, so this was the microservices architecture. Um, you can create a variety of containers through an orchestrator. 
And um, that's a bit of a different thing. You have pods and nodes and different stuff. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into that tonight. But you can have multiple instances of your application on containers that exist in uh, different locations. And again, it's kind of similar to the idea of microservices because you can easily spin up and spin down. Um, it's a little bit in more in between microservices and the model, with the, if I understand correctly, because full instances of your containerized application can be spun up and spun down really quick. So you'll have this, and then you'll have it three more times just like that in like Kubernetes, for example. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. So, how do they charge you? Why do they charge you? Why is the, the, um, the events that are occurring, or do they charge you by um, the process time? I mean, you, you mean like how, how much will it cost you to host yes. like this on Azure? Yes. Um, I think it's just cents per minute, like a very, very small amount per minute. I think that's all. It sounded like you were saying you could use the containers with microservices or without. Or you could. You, you don't need to use microservices. So you could wrap your entire application. Let's say you've got something really simple, like I did. I only used one container. You don't have to use microservices. So I put my entire application, the default like express templated application, into a single container and then served it. There's no other operations. Is there a size limitation or any other limitation as to you know, how big your application can be? It has to fit within the resources you provide for your container. So if your container only has so much storage, then it needs to be within that. Okay. Well, you pay for that too, right? You pay for, you pay for the storage. Um, yeah, so you can, like, there's nothing wrong with this inherently if you're using it, if, if you've got a really simple app, it's just like a website, people go to view stuff, nothing else. But as soon as you start adding other things, like if you've got an entire authentication workflow, then an app dedicated to handling user and administrator authentication would be pretty valuable because then all of your administration stuff is kind of just nicely put into a little box, and then all of the other stuff, like managing the shopping cart and things like that, they're in another box somewhere else. So whenever you know those guys over there screw it up, your work is just fine. Okay. So, so you could have maybe 10 websites all of the same. If you wanted to start scaling on it, there was a lot of people trying to get that website. Could you scale it out so you could yeah, so you'd have multiple instances of the same website created. And then now we start talking about virtual networks and things like that. Mm -hmm. To um, We can create automatic scale sets in Azure. That's one of the services we provide. So that when people hit your domain, it's automatically going to scale for you. And when you have 10 different instances, there's, a, there's a, an orchestrator there that will route traffic appropriately. So a, a user in LA and a user in New York wouldn't know that they're hitting the same or a different website. They all look the same. Exactly. They'll never know. They never know. Yeah. One thing I've wondered is I know Docker a huge advantage is like the consistent development environments and stuff like that. Yeah. So like, your team under pumping each step in there. Yeah. Races. But how this seems like it conflicts with like they if they're in development, any time they make a change and rebuild the image, then it seems like pretty slow. It's like those are at odds, kind of. Like, how do you reconcile that? So everything, every layer, every Docker command is a layer. And every one of those gets cached. And only the things you change get redone. So every time you have to rebuild, way quicker. Oh, almost so instant. You, you can't avoid that. You, you do have to rebuild. Uh, yeah, you're gonna, every time I update my source code and I want to test it in my container, I need to rebuild the image, yeah. So even if you have a simple and small application, there's still a use case for using the container? Yeah, um, like I said, it, at that point, it's a personal preference. If you've got like a really simple blog 
Um, you could use a container, but mm. I don't use a container for my blog, for example. I don't have it hosted in a container. Um, containers obviously can like, help improve the performance of an application in terms of like, time and all that. Mm -hmm. Does it minimize or does it kind of increase over time when people have to like, query different ports, different containers to get different services or different um, business logic kind of like into another service or another uh, thing inside the UI layer? I'm not sure what you're asking. Can you clarify? So obviously the UI layer and the database, they're both connected to microservices and they're all in their own container, right? So you'd have to query a separate like route or path. Does it affect the performance like, in terms of querying it? Because it's in the I mean, the does the communication between containers affect performance? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Um, I, I don't think so. No. It does, you know, there's a little bit more you have to program prior. The communication between them is negligible. You can just to follow up on my question. Yep. I guess Go on. I, want, I, I was. I, I guess I wanted to know if there's a rule of rule. Of, you know, is this like a rule that you use that if it's too small, too simple, there's no point in doing it? Like, is there like you got? It's got to be big. Is it? Is there some kind of a decision point when you start using Katina? It's probably just more of a feeling, yeah. and it's a preference. It's you. Even for gigantic applications, you don't have to use them. You're not obligated in any way to use a container. There's probably tons of corporations out there with tens of thousands of lines of code, and it looks just like the thing on the left, right? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's its own thing. That's its own problem. So, um, in the terminal, what was uh, uh, tagging something as, like the dash t? When you're tagging something, you're kind of creating a duplicate and then renaming it. So okay. when you have um, a cloud registry all set up, like on Azure, you can, take the, you can take the image that you put up in the cloud registry with the URL for the cloud registry, because then, or sorry, you can tag your local image, local image with the URL for the cloud registry, so that when you say Docker push, it knows where it needs to push it's like git push, you know, what, where's the repository that you provided with that ahead of time. So git push knows where that is. But docker push, you have to add it as a tag. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Again, how do you do the configuration? You have it in development, you want to push it to the production plan. What do you mean configuration files? Like environment? Yeah. Um, can you switch that or you just say? It's probably, could you just clarify more? I'm trying to think of what yeah. you mean. Can you please repeat um, the question? He's asking how you work with configuration files in the container environment. So you, you have something that you tested in your day and so you recommend it. Right? And so now you want to move it to uh, So, so environment variables and stuff yeah, is yeah, what you're asking about? Yeah, yeah. Let's say you've, you've got like a configuration file that your application is reading. As long as that file comes with you in the container, that's fine. Right. Then it's just there. Um, environment variables, though, you, you might need to, there is a, uh, there's a Docker command. So you know how I have in the Docker file things like expose, run, do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. There's one called env, env, and you can define environment variables. Isn't there also a dash E flag uh, where you can give a specific container an image upon building uh, an environment variable with a dash E flag? Uh, probably. I, I don't know. I've never used it. <coughs> Are there any, at least in your experience, issues, problems, added complexities with doing a container as opposed to just running it as, as it is if it's a simple so if you're trying to do microservices, you need to write your code like it's a microservice, a very small thing that talks to something else. It's a lot of like traffic between. Microservice, I'm just saying, just using containers. Forget about. Okay, okay, forget microservices. Are there any issues with just using containers that you know of? 
Like, you know, the downside, downside. I would just consider it like if you've got a really simple app that doesn't need any of the benefits of a container, it can just mm -hmm. exist on a virtual machine or like hosted in the cloud anywhere, then it's just an unnecessary step for you, the developer. If you want to explore containers just for your own personal knowledge, you could. Right, well, that's obviously, you know, it's an extra work you're going to have to do. But any other downsides that you know that you're coming across? Not, I mean, not that I know of. It's okay. just a, yeah. If you're running Docker on Windows, maybe. Like, if you've got a Windows, <laughs> if you've got a Windows host, um, it does, that could, it, like, just the Docker environment could hit some issues or something if you ever update. Because isn't Docker running on Windows in some fashion? You can... You can do both. You can no, create no, a container. Host, but I'm just I know. I know what you're asking, and I'm saying you can do both. Oh, you could. Yeah, you can create Linux containers or Windows containers okay. on Windows or on Linux. Mm -hmm. You can create containers where their OS is different from your host OS. Oh, okay. I guess to kind of clarify, and I'm hoping you could also like add to this remark, Docker is just built with GoLang. It's just like code. It's not really Linux. Uh, the only difference on Windows is there's like a bridge between uh, the way Docker communicates with like its underlying. Uh, the kernel. What was it? The kernel. Yeah. Is right. that what you're talking about? I know that Windows is like an extra thing in between the routing or the communication layer for Docker, but at the end it just go like right, just go. Yep. Is there a way to share code between different containers? Let's say you have some functionality of one computer that you want to be repeated in other parts. So. Well, then you would kind of create a third container mm -hmm. that has that code, okay. and both of them ask them so like an interface. It's like an API. Mm -hmm. And is there, in terms of scalability, is it manageable? Is it do yeah, yeah, yeah. Scalability is a really big benefit. Like thousand things, <coughs> thousand containers. Is there, is there manageable to keep, you know, code in separate things? Is, there, is that a point that the whole thing breaks well, down? Well, there, there. So you can create multiple instances, like I mentioned before, of a containerized application. So you could have ten containers inside your application doing different things, and you could add more and scale. Out, but you can also scale up and increase like the processing power of the virtual machine that's hosting your app with all the containers. Do you get it? Do you get what I mean? Scaling out versus scaling up. No, it's just I'm thinking about you know, let's say you have a very successful website, not just getting a lot of traffic, but you increasing the complexity of your code. Mm -hmm. With the continuous be able to manage this? The containers would, but you as the developer right. will have a hard time right. with each and every additional mm -hmm. um, microservice you add. But there's no way you to could, you, you just need to architect it properly. That's kind of, the onus of that is kind of on you more than containers themselves. So there's no way to manage this? this uh, the back and forth? Yeah, the, the connection and, yeah. Yeah. And let's I'm, say not, I'm not sure if anybody's like <laughs> created a product that will do that. Yeah. But listen, let's say you work in a team and you work in this and you need to be able to communicate with another team that's doing different things and if there's no system in place to connect those. I'm not sure. Okay. I wanted to ask about the bots this container I mean the serverless. Serverless code? So yes and if you so you're asking if you could use serverless things on like AWS Lambda I know right. they have that but we all like Azure has Azure functions right. with containers right. um, yeah you, you could use them in a collaborative way like you could have a container hosting an app that does something and like let's just say it's you've got one part of your app that's just logging data and every time your app logs data and it hits the database you're, you can have your function your serverless code listening for 
additions to that database. It can be listening for any type of event on that database, and then it'll execute some more code. And that's that's how you can connect them. Okay, so that's one way they can coexist, basically. Yeah, yeah. That's just one example. Functions can do way more than that. I, I, I assume companies are asking for us to, or are asking, or looking for employers that have this on their job uh, uh, listing. Um, and do you see, are there any way where you can become certified to do this? Or There's probably Docker and Kubernetes certifications out there. Mm. I've never looked, but I would, I would be shocked if there was not. No problem. Oh, <laughs> never ends. Okay. <laughs> I'm just curious. Do you have any experience with Docker Compose? Uh, minimally, like uh, a while, long time ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> did not have any. Yeah, I'm just curious. Just wanted to know more about this. In the container world, other than Kubernetes, is there anything else? I know you use that for orchestration. Is there anything else that comes into play? There are other orchestrators. Kubernetes is one of the orchestration options you can use. Well, other than orchestration, what other things are there? If you're starting to do containers, like Docker, you have Kubernetes, I keep hearing about it. Is there anything else other than orchestration that you need to do when you do containers? Um, I don't think so. I think just you get get a handle on containers before you try to jump to the, the higher the higher concepts. To add to that, uh, yeah, I think there do. are. There's like Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet. List goes on and on. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and open source as well. Yeah, lots of it. Oh, um, Terraform specifically, Terraform. I've worked with and contributed <coughs> to the project a few times. Uh, I was thinking about Apache has one too. Is it? Apache has I'm sorry? I heard Apache has a WIS as an open source for containers. Or Maybe. I'm not sure. Oh. Oh. All right. Well, if nobody else has any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm VJ. Thanks for coming to the meetup today. I'm the organizer for JavaScript LA. I wanted to just personally thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, I'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. We're slowly but surely making lots of little video content for you guys to enjoy and soak up, especially if you want to get better at programming. I'd love for you to be on our Slack channel too. Over 800 users. The link is right here, jsjoin, jsjo.in if you forget. It's really simple. If you have questions for this meetup or you know questions you didn't get to ask or because you couldn't make it, uh, we'd love to have you just post it in our Slack group. So if you're a newbie, don't worry. It's a good place to go. There's a lot of great engineers all connected around LA and Orange County. So I hope to see you there.